What you do, what's good with y'all boys, YouTube, it is your boy Stacks Reacts, and I'm back with another video. In today's video, we have Magic Johnson and Larry Bird, a courtship of rivals basketball. Now, y'all been requesting it for a very long time on all of my other Larry Bird reactions, so it's only right I brought this, and I am going to split it up into four parts, so I'm guessing this will be part one. Hey, Larry Legend is that guy, but also y'all said him and Magic Johnson basically like saved the game of basketball, so I want to see how they were able to do that. I want to see what's going on with this, so let's go ahead and get it to it. We're probably going to do like the first 30 minutes of this and then we'll just keep splitting it up as we go but hey let's go ahead and get into it man all right man let's see what we got they talk about it every day somewhere if i go to a foreign country magic magic what magic it's the same everywhere to see each other. We don't have to say hello. We don't have to call each other. That's my main competition. It's always been like that. You know you got this tight bond with this cat and you don't have to see him for a year or two. Uh, That's real. But you're always going to be linked to them. Those are definitely real friends. One that you, you know, you haven't talked to them for months, or maybe even years at a time you, you know, hit them or get in contact with them. And then like, it feels like y'all never stop talking to each other. That's what I'm getting from this right now. Real genuine friendship right here. Friendships like robbery. It's never going to be broken. I mean, right to our graves. They'll be talking about this 100 years from now. Hey, man, that's right. A lot of newspaper articles on these games. Must have been big. Lakers and Celtics. Michigan it all State. began here in Salt Lake City, Utah, on the night of March 26, 1979. Wow. It was the NCAA championship, Indiana State versus Michigan State, a game that still ranks as the highest rated college final ever on television. A game that's not. If y'all would like for me to watch this, this is when they were in college or playing the finals or whatever, like he said, please let me know in the comment section is it worth doing a reaction to? Uh, if if y'all request it, I'll go ahead and get on it, but let's continue. It's a prologue to a rivalry that transformed a sport and intertwined two legacies. But on that night, March 26, 1979, the first time Magic Johnson and Larry Bird ever went head to head on a basketball court, they were simply two young men trying to win a very big ball game. Well, this is probably the biggest game I'll ever play in my life. And I just feel like, you know, I'm representing not only myself, my team, but we're representing our school and our, and our town, Terre Haute. Well, it's uh, a dream come true, really, for me. Uh, I won the state title back in my home state. And then my next accomplishment was going to the NCAA and Irvin. Uh, a game like tonight in the finals. They were two stars thrown together by the cosmos to compete. Wait, but what did I miss? I'm trying to read that news article, trying to catch everything. Uh, a dream come true really for me. Uh, I won the state title back in my home state. And then my next accomplishment was going to the NCAA and playing in uh, a game like tonight in the finals. They were two stars thrown together by the cosmos to compete. Okay. Roger Irvin Johnson left, and Indiana Larry Bird will be big guns in Monday's NCAA final. Okay. So this was a very well anticipated game. But only one of them had been groomed for the spotlight. In his case, it seemed since birth. I think his upbringing in East Lansing really put that smile on his face in the beginning, and, and it never came off. Born August 14, 1959, Irvin Johnson grew up in Lansing, the gritty industrial capital city of Michigan. Raised under this little roof, he was one of Christine and Irvin Johnson Sr.'s 10 kids. Wow, 10? Christine was a school custodian, while Irvin Sr. worked two jobs nearly around the clock. My father, he got up early every morning, 6 o'clock or so, and uh, he went to work on his trash hauling truck every single day. Around noon, he would come home, catch a nap, 
and then he worked for General Motors for 30 years. Damn, he won man. The award for never being late and never uh, missed a day. As he That's crazy. No matter what that situation was, they had 10 children. Obviously, I can just tell just by the way Magic Johnson is talking, he's just very humble. Those humble beginnings is what made him what he is. His mom was a janitor and his dad worked two jobs around the clock, never complained, never was late, anything like that. And he ended up raising one of the greatest basketball stars to ever come across the NBA. That that's literally insane. Like that's that's just a blessing. Like if he, he if he didn't have that beginning of, you know, seeing his parents bust their ass to take care of them and his siblings, he probably wouldn't be the person he is today. And that's one thing I can't say. I come from the same thing, and that's why I'm working so hard to try to get to where I'm at because I want to take care of my people because I come from humbling beginnings as well. Respect, Magic, respect. As a youngster, Irvin displayed his own strong work ethic on the blacktop. I was out there all day long before we went to school bus leave at 7 7 30 i was out there at 6 6 30 my game my mother sometimes had to bring me food or she would have one of my brothers and sisters go get that boy so he could eat something from a very young age Irvin knew what he wanted to do he had it all planned out my dreams were to play in the nba and become a businessman the first neighborhood basketball powerhouse sexton high Sex. I knew the players, I knew the tradition. I wanted to be a part of that. And it was on the west side of town, which was at that time predominantly black. West side, the best side. <laughs> but when Lansing, like many cities in the mid 70s, began busing to desegregated school system, Irvin's journey took an unexpected detour to a predominantly white school across town. My first day at Everett High School was my first time I really had to understand there was a, a race problem. Nobody white would speak to anybody black, and nobody black would speak to anybody white. A lot of racial tension, a lot of fights, rioting. They didn't want minorities there. That's right. He kind of shrugged it off, and basically his... I don't remember which historical... Um, which historical event this was, but I know that once they like uh, integrated the schools or whatever, mixed the black and whites together, like the whites would be on the top balcony, like throwing stuff at the black people, calling them racial slurs and stuff. I'm trying to think it's going to hit me. It, it will hit me. I promise it'll hit me. I don't remember who it was, what exact story I remember, you know, um, hearing, but that's basically what they did, man. I, I w wouldn't even be able to imagine what was going on, like throwing rocks, like just doing anything to try to harm them, man. It's crazy. The attitude was. But that's crazy. just all they knew because that's what was going on during the time. That's what their parents were like. So that's what, you know, they thought was right, even though it wasn't right. You know what I'm saying? Everybody is, you know, human. Everybody bleeds the same. Hey, well, I'll, I'll overcome this. Whenever there was any racial problems, the principal would get urban and go talk to these kids. I can just see him with his big hands, calm down, just calm down, he'd break up fights. Talk with his friends, tell him, you know, let it go, you know, we can't fight about everything. Let's just chill, let's play basketball. That's right. There was no dispute over Irvin Johnson's ability to play ball. His talent was so great that soon after his varsity debut, a local reporter dazzled by his exploits. Irvin Magic Johnson sauntered over to the bench a smile covering his youthful face and slapped the hands of each one of his teammates. Then the 6'5 sophomore looked up at the appreciative Everett Vikings fans, clenched his fist over his head in a sign of victory, and sat down. 6'5 as a sophomore is literally insane. I'm 6'5 right now, but I was like probably 6'2 when I was a sophomore, so that just goes to show that, you know, God had a plan for him. He definitely was blessed genetically for sure if he was 6'5 as a sophomore. Gave the budding star a nickname. Magic. In the beginning, I thought it was foolish and dumb. And, you know, I didn't know nothing about a nickname. Then what happened was, you start saying, wait a minute, it fits my game. Hanging out with my boys on the street corners, we used to sing Temptation songs. <laughs> they started saying, hey man, Magic, that's cool. And then people on the street start saying, hey Magic. And I said, hmm. <laughs> he bought into it and, um, I think he felt he had to kind of live up to that name. 
Mobile games are I'm going sorry, y'all. YouTube Premium is through the ass. I gotta download Please, the other thing I told me to get. And I must say that he did. The afro is tough. The more attention he got, you know, he just he wanted attention from anybody he could get it from. <laughs> yeah, it does, honestly. I really love the game, and uh, I just want to win. Hey, oh my! Irvin loved to dress. Nice sandal belt and pants and overcoats with the, the fur around the collar. Always had to have his afro blown out. He had to look the part, play the part. Irvin was the first guy to have a posse. He not only had a posse of a lot of black kids, he had a lot of oh white my kids God. and hanging around him. Some of my white friends was like, hey man. Uh, we're having a kegger tonight. Won't you come on by? And I'm said, what's a kegger? A kegger. So he said, well, uh, what it is, we get this big keg of beer, and you just go for it. Okay. Well, what time does the, the kegger start? Because regular party time in our neighborhood is 10, 11 o'clock. Uh, the kegger starts at 7. I oh, said, my goodness. The party starts at 7 o'clock? I said, okay, man, I'm going to come to the kegger. We had a good time. The music was kind of bad, but we had a good time, <laughs> you know. Was the music the bad or year, different? Johnson did at Everett what he had planned to do at Sexton, win the state championship. And when it came to choosing a college, he decided to stay where the love would be assured, home in Lansing. Next year, I will be uh, attending Mission State University. That's real, man. At MSU, Magic star quickly went national. Look at the but fedora. The college game, he soon discovered a certain presence beside him. Uh oh. Larry Bird. I saw Larry Bird it was actually in a magazine. <laughs> saw his stats. Blown away by his stats. But let's see if he can really do it against us. And that's always a mindset of black players if he's a great white player. In 1978, after his freshman year, Magic would quickly find out when both he and Bird were chosen to play for Team USA in the World Invitational Tournament. They would put Larry Bird and I on the same team together to scrimmage, right? It, it was blowing my mind because he's dominating Jack Givens, player of the year in college basketball. Hey. Larry Bird is eating him alive. <laughs> I couldn't wait to call home to tell my pass. boys, man. This dude named Larry Bird is for real. Oof. This is the baddest white dude I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> well, I thought he was very good. There's no question about it. I Actually, I thought he was probably the best guard on the team. Oh, no look. We didn't get to play a lot, but you could tell. I think our first game was in Kentucky. We got about a 10, 12-point lead. Man, they put us in went to 25 30 just that fast damn fast break again three on two Ooh, no look again man look at larry playing take us out the league go back down put us back in that's third and johnson the show start again when you play with magic there's just something about it you want to make that extra pass you want to get that rebound and start to break contagious Contagious came energy. down a couple times. I go behind my back, no look to him. He no look back to me. And I'm laying it up. I'm saying, oh, man. Here's that last play. Magic oh, look at that. Bird. Bird puts it back off inside to Larry Bird. Larry Bird. Larry Bird. Oh, look at that. Larry Bird literally pump fake, went under, and wrapped it around two defenders, bro. He split both of them and got the pass off. That is really impressive. Really impressive. Let's run it back a little bit. I'm laying it up. I'm saying, oh, man. Look at the no look. Right back to him. Up, under. Come on, man. This guy got game. They had some wonderful moments on the court, but they probably spoke to each other four, maybe five times during that entire time period. And, and it was more like, hello, how are you this morning, Larry? I'm good, Magic. What'd you have for breakfast? Don't remember. Have a nice day. <laughs> but such curtness was hardly strange coming from Larry Bird who is not only one of college basketball's best players, but also its biggest enigma. I think he was a mystery to the extent that, that, that he wanted to be a mystery. He didn't enjoy doing interviews. He didn't go out of his way to do them. He wasn't particularly good at them. 
He was kind of like, hey, this is who I am. You want to know who I am? Watch the game. That's who I am. Now, seeing that Larry Bird wasn't really for the media just shows you that he's like face a face value type of person. He's one of those guys where, hey, you see me in person. This is what you get. I don't live any facade, things like that. He's like one of those dudes who's going to go out there, drop 30, go home, go to sleep. Not checking social media, not bragging about it, nothing like that. But he's going to talk shit you know, to you while you're on the court playing against you. But he ain't going to be one of those ones going all over social media, just on the interviews, like he said, like saying he wasn't good at them. Just shows that Larry Bird is a genuine guy. I start to read materials that you're very quiet and you don't enjoy talking to newspaper people. Well, you know, there's different kind of newspaper paper people. Uh, there's uh, people that try to push you. You know, there's people who try to get things out of you. Things don't even pertain to basketball. And them the type of people I like to stay away from. He didn't Facts. want people talking about his family. He didn't want his mother to have to deal with that or his siblings to have to deal with that. You got to remember where Larry came from. You know, Larry was raised in a two or three room house on a railroad track. Their family probably lived on $50 a week. He was raised hey. tough. Larry? Larry Joe Bird grew up in Southern Indiana in the twin towns of French Lick and West Baden. The Valley, as locals call it, was a tough working class area. Tiny and remote, it was one of the poorest places in the state. Hey, man. I didn't know that people made millions of dollars. I didn't know that everybody had a family car. I was in my own cocoon. I was in a small town with the people I knew, and I thought I'd live there for the rest of my life. Arriving Pearl Harbor Day, 1956, Larry was the fourth of six kids born to Georgia and Joe Bird. Early on, he and his older brothers earned a reputation around the valley. That's crazy. Him and his brothers, like, and his sister, too, they, their genes are strong, bro. Like, they look so much alike. I want to look up and see, like, what they look like now, just to see if they kind of resemble each other still. We were always considered troublemakers. We're either fighting <laughs> oh, amongst ourselves well. or there was always one of us fighting somebody. <laughs> Larry was always one that kind of instigated things, you know. If I get my brother in a fight with somebody his age, I was happy as hell because I like to see him get beat up, and that's just the way it was. If if I got in a, a scrape with some kid and my brothers didn't come to my side, they knew that when he got home, my dad was going to whip him. Larry and my dad were best of friends. They done everything together. When my dad would go out to my grandma's house, Larry would always go with him. They'd go fishing, do a lot of things together. Mm. But Joe Bird also had a darker side, oh. stemming from a traumatic tour of duty in Korea. Larry remembers oh, we waking up in the middle of the night hearing his father's blood-curdling screams from the nightmares he had had from the war. What happened to his father in the war affected his entire life. He was never able to quite get rid of whatever those demons were. A talented craftsman, Joe Bird struggled to hold steady jobs. And even when he was working, his demons would on occasion drive him to the bottle. There were times when Joe went out with the guys and had a few beers and the wages didn't come home that night. And that didn't happen every day. Uh, it happened once in a while, but when money is as tight as it was for the birds, once in a while was a major problem for their family. Yeah. My mom sometimes. One thing I can say, if you're going through stuff and you trying to um use alcohol to like take away those problems, that only makes that problem worse because one thing you're ruining your health and two, you're spending unnecessary money that you don't need to, honestly. And then it just gets worse and worse over time because your body just becomes so accustomed. You're just building that tolerance the more and more you drink, and then this is gonna be to a point where your kidneys fail, you know, you just in bad shape, man. Y'all make sure y'all taking care of yourself though. And if y'all have any issues, Find somebody to talk to because that's very important, man. Judging from this, his dad does seem like a great guy, but, you know, he just, he had problems, man. He went through, you know, war. That's very traumatic. That's very traumatic. That's something that sticks with people for a very long time or something that's very serious. So definitely get it, but, you know, that still shouldn't be the way. Drive him to the bottle. There were times when Joe went out with the guys and had a few beers and the wages didn't come home that night. And that didn't happen every day. Uh, it happened once in a while, but when money is as tight as it was for the birds, once in a while was a major problem for their family. 50 bucks a week. My mom sometimes worked late, and sometimes she had two jobs, but that's the way it was. I worked at school during my lunch hours, or hmm. at the local grocery store, put up hay in the summer. I mean, if you wanted money, you had to get it on your own. Facts. 
To young Larry, actions spoke louder than words. He was very quiet, kind of hung to himself a little bit. I saw Larry take an F in an English class because he had to get up in front of his peers and give a speech. He said, I won't do it. But he just could not get up in front of his friends and talk. He was that shy. Of course, next thing you know, when he knew it was time for all of us together at the gymnasium, well, there he'd be. Talking crap. <laughs> and he'd get a basketball in his hand. Things were totally different. Basketball was just, it came to me, seemed like easy. I didn't have the quickness. I didn't have jumping ability. I just thought the game out. By his senior year at Springs Valley High, Larry Bird had sprouted into a star. But Bird was from the Valley, hardly a hotbed of talent in the big time world of Indiana hoops. The first thing they say, well, they don't play nobody down there. He's from French Lick. They don't play nobody. Yeah. I think that put a chip on his shoulder, always having to prove who he was and how good he was. He was good enough for Indiana University's Bobby Knight to come calling late his senior year. And folks in the Valley couldn't have been prouder. Their local hero was heading 60 miles north to play ball for one of the best college teams in the land. Once I got to IU, it didn't take long to realize that I was out of my cocoon. I had over 30-some thousand students. Yep. That I didn't have the funds. First week and a half, I thought, man, this ain't gonna work. He left after 24 days. Wow, man. Let my mother down. She didn't talk to me for two months. But it didn't matter what other people say. To this day, I don't care. Damn, man. That's real. Back in French Lick, Bird took to working for the city, hauling trash and painting park benches. Meanwhile, by that winter, his father's demons had taken him to an even darker place. Oh. By this point, Joe and Georgia were divorced, and he was behind in his payments to the family. The police came by, and of course, they all knew him. So Joe said, hey, I need a few hours to get my affairs together before you take me away. So he called Georgia, and he said, you guys will be better off without me, and I'm going to take my life. And he put the phone down, and, and he killed himself. Mm. He killed himself. Oh. Dad passed, you know, it hurt Larry. I mean, that was his best friend. He's gone now. And, but Larry didn't show it a lot. He just didn't say much, you know, he just kind of held it within. I never, I've never heard him speak out about it at all. I was mad when I heard about it. And I was madder after the funeral because I thought he sort of cut out on us during a, a tough time. Yeah. You know, he went, he went through a lot in his life. He did what he had to do. If Bill Hodges hadn't been as persistent as he had been, Larry Bird might never have existed in any of our minds. I believe that with all my heart. I really do. It was Bill Hodges, a young coach from Indiana State University, who convinced Bird to give college hoops another shot. So with a promise to his mom to graduate, Bird headed to Terre Haute in ISU, a school that never so much had been to the NCAA tournament. Once I started playing, it's the same old thing. You know, he's at a small school and he ain't playing against anybody, <clears throat> which is fine. Still dominated. <laughs> Stop playing with Larry, man. Now his claim to fame is just the way he plays the game. Oh, fake out. As a new state bird. It's not the card no now. Hey Larry, take a bow. Indiana has a new state bird. By the time he had led Tiny ISU as a senior to a 33 and 0 record. Damn. A spot in the 79 title game. Larry Bird had become alongside Magic Johnson the talk of college basketball. Just a year after sharing the court on Team USA, they were back together. And the day before the big game, Magic couldn't wait to greet his old playmate. And then State was on practicing, and we were waiting in the tunnel. We got there early. I wanted to definitely say hello to Larry, you know. When they came through, it was like nobody was saying nothing. I wanted to go toward him, like his guys, like, made sure 
that he didn't say nothing. And then they kind of start snickering, like, Michigan State, you in trouble. We're going to kill you guys tomorrow. I probably did snub him. I don't remember it, but I'm, I'm sure I did. I didn't want any, you know, like I call it love fest, hugging and, and, and slapping high fives with opponent. You're there for a reason. You're there to win a game. That just said it's on now. Damn. It is Indiana That's State real, bro. State. I'm Bryant Gumbel, and the fans here are going for That's the mindset you got to have. Let's face it. If, if Larry Bird were black and, and came from Chicago, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. They, they, were, they were polar opposites. One black, one white, one outgoing, one shy. That was the charm of the attraction. The bird against magic. All of the superlatives have been used, and believe me, all of them have been warranted. Heading into the tournament, magic was the bigger star. But by tip-off, it was bird. Having hardly missed a shot in the semifinal would become the focus. Man. The fans, and more importantly, of Michigan State. We actually had two men on Larry everywhere he went. Man. I'm surprised they didn't play a box on one, you know, four guys on Larry and one on the other four. Um, because that's they didn't have a lot of talent. You know, if you stop Larry, you pretty much stop them. Look at the pressure around him. Two, three, men. And he's short. I didn't play well at all. Biggest game of my life, I didn't play well. I think our, our length and our size, our jumping ability was able to bother him. I didn't shoot well, missed, uh, I think, three free throws. He was just nervous, man. It's all right. Has had a cold shooting night. I battled him, but I didn't have it. Dang! Oh! Full court? No. Oh, that's disrespectful, man. That's disrespectful. Magic, not only were you a leader on offense, I thought you did a great job on Larry Bird in the zone denying him the ball. Yes, uh, Coach uh, gave us a good game plan to go against Larry Bird, and all we had to do was go out and do it. That's what we've done. And congratulations, Super Bowl game. Taking the net. It was over, you know. That was my four years. I was done. No, it still hurts. And when you win 33 in a row and you walk into a game, you know, you never know what to expect, but it, I expect to win. We didn't win. The fact is he probably could have had like the worst um, record in college, came back and won that one game and that would have outweighed everything. So all those wins he got just basically felt like nothing to him, which is one thing I respect about him. So I, basically I feel like what happened to his dad, this right here, that basically gave him that chip on his shoulder once he got to the league, and that's why he was such a dominant player. Um, kind of hard. It seems like it's kind of hard to get in his head, though. Even though he played bad this game, don't matter. Seemed like it was kind of hard to get in his head. Seemed like, um, you know, he was very competitive. That's what I like about Larry. He's very competitive, seems gritty. Both come from humble beginnings, but, man, it's just crazy to think about. Like, I wish I would have been able to witness this, though. It would have been great. Toughest loss I ever took. I, I knew it was going to haunt him forever because we were going to see each other a lot. The National Basketball Association in its 33rd season is troubled by diminishing crowds and declining television ratings, signs that fan interest may be waning. Oh. If college basketball was flourishing at the end of the 1970s, the pro game was crumbling. After the golden era of Bill Russell and Jerry West in the 1960s, a merger with the ABA in 1976 had led not only to new teams, but a new temperament. You know. It was a new league with new times, with renegades, with individuals. There was an argument made, plausibly, I think, that it was too black a league for the United what? States of America in the late 1970s. You think about the Knickerbockers at the time. The running joke was it was the Knickerbockers. You know, it was the, it, it, that's what it was. It, it was the huh? N word. It's turning off a lot of white white customers that are coming to the game. You know, uh, why? 
I think there's still a, there's a conflict between the white and the black, and uh, I don't enjoy going to the basketball and seeing all black players. I mean, I, I think it's it, when they said too black, they <sighs> meant not just in terms of color, but in terms of style. Let me get mine, and the hell with yours. Basketball for us was about the best moves. You wanted to be uh, that big player that everybody talked about. You wanted to be the one. You didn't think about winning championships or team play. And those were just the issues on the court. Okay. That's the crazy. NBA, he had this image of an all-black league with a bunch of guys who did drugs. The teams were losing money, and uh, they had no sponsors. And that's pretty much a death knell right there. It's a known fact that you need your white superstars. Uh, you just need more white ball players on the team for the white fans to identify with. <laughs> And in the newest member of the Boston Celtics, that's exactly what the league appeared to be getting. There's hope he can help solve professional basketball's difficulties. Mm, so that's that's what y'all mean by Larry Bird and Magic help save um, the NBA. So basically, I haven't heard Magic's side yet, but looks like everybody was saying the league was too black or whatever. Um, black as far as swag, things like that. Like, they cared about, you know... Scoring on the court, looking pretty, all this kind of stuff. And also, the people didn't like to come to the games and see all of that. So, Larry Bird gets drafted, and I'm guessing that kind of, like, shakes things up, like, dramatically. Also, I saw that um college basketball was actually above, like, the NBA. So, I'm guessing, like, since the tickets and everything were declining, the NBA was probably almost going to be just completely just nothing like just, or almost taken away so them getting drafted into the league kind of just shook things up and i'm guessing their rivalry probably sparked that sparked that fuel to get the nba back rolling on the track its own and now it's like probably the one of the biggest sports now for sure basketball say are compounded by a question of black and white the great it, white hope what does that mean well you know uh, it's very hard to say because there's a lot of great white players around, and, and I just hope that I can just fit in as well as some of them that has fit in. He ran away from that designation. He made it very clear, almost from day one, that he was not the great white hope. You know, the, the great players are the black players, and they're the best. Such deference meant little to black Celtics like Curtis Rowe, Sidney Wicks, and Cedric Maxwell, who looked at Bird and saw not the great white hope, but another case of great white hype. He didn't impress hype? me no more than any white guy I've ever seen play before. I think that you would say that most black players at the time were racist. In wow. the sense that we did not think that you could find a, a white guy who could play better than any black guy. When I walk in the first day not of camp, sure. them guys were on the floor stretching and here comes the white savior, here comes this, here comes that. I sort of enjoyed it because I knew I was <laughs> going to battle them all day. Curtis and Sidney didn't last long. They didn't even make it through the first practice. And they were cut. So that was just Cedric. I'm thinking, oh, he's slow. He can't get off a shot. He's not that strong. This is going to be a layup. Bam. Knocks down the jump shot. Okay. Maybe that was luck. Gets the ball again. Bam. Automatic. Down another jump shot. Now. The way Larry Bird just loads the ball and just lets it go just looks so efficient. Like, I wish I just had that jump shot for him. Like, him, it's just beautiful, man. It's beautiful for him. I love it. I'm thinking, like, okay, hey, you know what? I'm going to D this guy up. I'm going to show him his life. 20 feet away. Bam. 25 feet away. Bam. <laughs> I, my mind just goes so good. Damn, this white guy can play. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good thing, too. The storied Celtics might have been the winningest team in NBA history, but they were fresh off their worst season in 30 years. And in Bird, they had a player who was not only supremely talented, but tough enough to take on any challenge. You know, I always played like everybody in the world was against me. Tough as nails, boy. Look at him. They ain't jumping this man. To get me rattled a game. Ooh, look at He's Larry. I know Larry's that. a fucking gangster. <laughs> I didn't realize he was so gritty. Like, well, I did say he was gritty, but I didn't realize he was actually like beating people up. That's crazy. Twenty feet away. What? Man, Twenty-five feet away. Larry man. throwing the punches. I, my mind just goes so good. Damn, this white guy can play. <laughs> it was a good thing too. The storied Celtics might have been the winningest team in NBA history, 
but they were fresh off their worst season are in you serious years. and in bird they had a player who was not only supremely talented but tough enough to take on any challenge you know, I always played like everybody in the world was against let go of them man oh my god I should think up things to get me rattled before a game he knew how to fight I know that from off the floor one night somebody was giving one of his buddies a hard time and Larry went over and you know said hey you know this is my friend and this guy was a pretty good sized guy by golly they go out back and the guy turns and says something to Larry and I mean Larry, oh my god this guy and I caught look him. you could just imagine the impact that's about to come from that punch look how far he's freaking leaning back bro you can't even see his arm that punch right there is coming from the gates of hell hit him so hard I go whoa he was from the old school and I, that's how he played Larry Bird damn <laughs> played the game hard played rough there was no frills about him he came in he threw elbows there was nothing smooth about Larry he's a dog he's just a dog bro he's a and dog others like that they're hard-working people they like that that's how people view them and that's what Larry was Larry Bird Look at him. I remember that. They also like winners. And when Bird led the Celtics to the NBA championship Oof. in just his second season, he was finally Ooh, won reverse. Boston loved Larry Bird. It just wasn't so clear at first how much Bird loved the city back. There's only one place I'd rather be, French Lick. Thank you. Man, Larry was almost agoraphobic in his treatment of anything outside his hometown. He wanted to be the Wizard of Oz. He wanted to intimidate people and keep them at bay. The further we are away from each other, the more I like him. I had a nice little house. I had my little yard. I want to go from there to practice back. If we had a game coming up, I want to go there, the game, and back home. That's right. All basketball. My whole life was basketball. If he was just sitting there, it was just me, just even looking around, mumbling, trying to find things that we had in common that we could talk about. Now, we started talking about basketball, we started talking about players, it was, you know, it was great. Uh, U.S. history? No. You know, we forced passes, we made errors down the stretch. Daily events? No. I made the shots, and from then on, we was up by two, and they had to get back in the game, which they did. Politics? No. Try to not do anything I can't do, or do no more than what I can do. I just go out and try to do my basic game. He proudly dubbed himself the Hick from French Lick, and he looked every bit the part. <laughs> those who played him for simple did so at their own peril. One of the great ways, I think, of winding up with no money in your pocket is to think Larry Bird is dumb. Syntax is not intelligence. Unlettered is not stupid. He's got a great sense of humor. He just didn't show that to people. That didn't mean he didn't Doberman? have it. He did, however, allow the... You know what they say, man. The ones who are the quietest are the ones who are the most dangerous. The ones who say the most are actually the ones who are the weakest. For sure. Like, if you've ever been in a fight or something like that, and you just hear somebody just yapping, 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 usually the one that's being quiet is the one that's going to whoop that person's ass, for real. And that's, that's who Larry is, man. He's one of those surprise people like, hey. And from him being quiet, when you're more quiet, you're able to be more observant. Once you... Once you're observant and you just, you know, you pay attention and you look around and you just listen to what's going on and actually pay attention to it, you can really feel out who people are within, like, the first 10 words that they say, for sure. That's how I am. I'm very observant when I go out in public. Like, on here, talking to y'all easy. But if I go out in public and I'm around a new group of people or something like that, it's just, I'm not that open and right off the rip. I need to listen, feel out for everybody because I can I can feel vibes. That's, that's how Larry is, bro. I can just feel that from him. The public won small indulgence. You could come out on Saturday and watch him mow his lawn. Huge crowd started to stop. Larry Bird's cutting grass in front of his house. <laughs> <laughs> He's mowing his lawn in the springtime. Larry is about doing things himself. And I think it's one of the things that made him so beloved in Boston. But as Bird navigated through his new world, he still had one eye fixed on a familiar foe in a faraway land. Uh-oh. Big magic. All right, we're getting up on that 30-minute mark, y'all. was I'm riding, right? I'm riding in the limo. And I'm seeing orange trees. Okay, look. 
we're at the 30 minute mark i'm definitely going to split this up into four parts this is part one if y'all have enjoyed this reaction so far don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel part two is going to be coming really soon stash reacts out peace